Hello and welcome to another edition of the 10 Plus Club, where we talk to business owners who have successfully run their business in excess of 10 years. And it's not many businesses that get to their 10th birthday, but Michael Richardson of the Michael Richardson Football Academy has done exactly that. Michael, hello and welcome to the 10 Plus Club. Hi, Marcus. Thank you for, for having us today. Now, you used to be a professional footballer. Is that right? From from quite a young age. Is that correct? Yeah, my background is is football and I, I played for a professional football club from eight years of age. Like most young boys, it's sort of the the childhood dream, um, especially in this country where it's our national sport to, to you know go on and play football in a professional capacity. So I was I was lucky to be able to do that. The Michael Richardson Football Academy is, from my understanding, I mean, it, it employs like over 20 coaches, 25 coaches. You uh, teach thousands of children every week across a number of multiple locations. It's quite a business that you've established, right? I'm a big believer in sort of, Everything happens for a reason. So we go back to playing and, and unfortunately no longer playing. And and one of the things that, you know, I wanted to do was be able to to provide opportunity for children in, you know, especially the local area that I, I brought up in. Um, and obviously over 11 years, that's now expanded and gone into to multiple areas across Essex and now Hertfordshire as well. Um, so, yeah, it's obviously nice to see how it has grown and expanded and, the people that have come along that journey and the, the coaches who have been part of that journey who may no longer be here now and uh, have, have moved on to other sort of uh, career paths or opportunities. Um, but yeah, our, our ethos as a business, we're a big believer in around sport plays a huge part in your life and can give you sort of core values that, that help you to become successful in any industry, in any walk of life. And that's children and adults as well. How old were you when you started the business? Was it like how long before, you know, what was the transition between ending football mm -hmm. uh, as a career and starting as a coach? What was that transition period and, and how was that? How did you do it? Sure. Yeah. So so when I finished playing, I was around 19 um, and being really truthful um, didn't really know what the next steps were. Um, wasn't sure what I was going to do. And and by chance, it was actually my old um, youth team coach at the football club I played at. And he said, why don't you come down and, and help at the, at the football club and do some coaching there within the academy, which is what I did. Um, and then sort of slowly fell in love with it again. Um, and I was probably 19, nearly 20, and I made the decision that I wanted to try and set up again it wasn't really a business then because it was more you know I wanted to do some coaching and provide opportunity so like new businesses it started out as a bit of a one-man band and you know you you become an expert at absolutely everything or you have to um, and, that, and that's where it really started from I just wanted to to, to, to coach and, and have an opportunity to because I felt I had so much knowledge and information that I could pass on and and support younger children with um so that's yeah really the transition i would say probably six months from from stopping playing into sort of the business idea coming about and, and starting to be launched and at what point did you start to think hang on a minute this is actually a business that i can grow at what point did that happen in in this process it almost felt like initially it was more of an opportunity for me personally to, to build my own personal brand and, and my own development as a coach. You know, being 19, 20 years of age, you know, and even now at 31, I would never confess to be the finished article as a coach. You know, I've always got things we could be better at. Um, but I'd, I'd say from, from really early on, I felt there was an opportunity, I say a gap in the market to have real quality provision for children in the area that we work in. Um, so that, yeah, I, I've always had that belief and always been pretty confident that we or I to start with, but we as a business are able to, to build on it and, and grow bigger and bigger and bigger. And how much of the success of the business has been driven by the commercialization of football and 
how it reaches every home and even now with girls as well, with women's football as well. Because I noticed a lot of your uh, sort of coaching is aimed at girls as well, as, as well as boys. Um, how much do you think you've benefited from that explosion of football mania across the world? I think, you know, in, in England in particular, obviously it's our, it's our national sport, you know, and it's so easy Again, I, you know, I've got young children now and, and the first thing you do is you go and look for classes and you get them a ball and you say, right, let's start playing a bit of football or, or it could be other sports. And and again, so I do, I do think you're right that we have sort of had an advantage because of that. And I think more so with, with the female side of things over the last five years, the female game has really exploded and, and there's now more opportunity. And I think the most exciting thing for young girls is actually they can really see it as a career path. Whereas 10 years ago, it, that may have not been the case, wasn't the opportunity there. So that may have been a stumbler. Um, so I think, you know, people like the FA and, and organi organisations like ourselves have really helped to give girls a platform to be able to come and play football and, 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 and champion them and be successful. Um, you know, we, we started our girls' programme in November 2019. Um, Obviously, we all know what happened in 2020. And, and through that process, we went from 15 girls to 100 girls. And, you know, we couldn't even, you know, physically see some of those girls. So it's amazing how the game has exploded and, and the opportunities that are now there for, for young girls. But, yeah, I think we, we certainly have benefited from it. And, but I would always say, and we as a team, it's, it's the coaches that are in our organisation that have been here, who have since been here and left and moved on, everyone's played a part in creating a really great environment where children can create memories and, and, and feel like they're valued and, and build on all those other softer skills. And um, our mantra as a business is using sport to change lives. And, you know, we're a big believer in that. I think anyone who's played a sport, not just football, will attribute the values they have in their adulthood to things through sport. It might be, you know, working in teams, it might be leadership, it might be communication skills, it could be confidence, it could be resilience. There's so many other skill sets that you can develop through sport and football. And that's that's really what we try and draw out within what we do. And I guess it's quite a difficult balancing act, really, with maybe the dream aspect of so many of those children who are hoping to get signed or trialed with a football club. And that's, I imagine a lot of what you have to do as coaches is to keep kids grounded and support them, almost sort of support the mental health aspect of this sort of side of it. Because as we know, it's a, it's a difficult sort of, sort of road to tread, that balance between creating the skills uh, that give people the rounded resilience and, and bring out the potential of children, as well as the disappointment that might come from trialing and not landing a club or landing a club and then losing your place there. Is that something that you as coaches or you personally sort of get involved with? We truly believe that high quality coaching should be accessible for everyone. So we'll have what we would call our development centres, which is essentially football for all. Anyone can come, anyone can join it. And, and yeah, you will get, you know, parents and players who have those aspirations. And, and you, I believe you don't want to dampen those down because as a young child, that excitement and that, that pure joy to want to play football and see your role models that play in the Premier League or play for England or wherever. So I think we, we lean on that, but it's also an education piece for the player and the parent as well around what are the chances of that. And, and we really do, especially with the parents, champion those softer skills and support the parents more so than the player initially. I think that we've, we've all been there and I, I, I would definitely say, you know, I was really lucky that I had very supportive parents, but I can safely say that when I was a lot younger, that my, my dad would definitely be someone who, would drive me and sometimes it wouldn't be intrinsic and myself that was doing it it'd be extrinsic and it's coming from him so it's you know if we can educate parents and how they can support their child effectively I think that's a really important piece and you know my background as well as being in business 
you know, I've spent time in professional football clubs and over the last three or four years in particular, football clubs are getting much better at that, that piece where, you know, the mental health side of things and looking after players and that aftercare, so much so that, you know, in some of the bigger clubs, um, there's, you know, full-time roles for two, three, four people. Um, obviously, smaller clubs might have one that, that sort of does that piece. And I think it is so important, you know, how we look after those players and children through that process and after that process, if it doesn't, it isn't successful. Um, you know, I'll go back to my own story. You know, I played football and then all of a sudden it was taken away from me very quickly. Um, and I would say it's not until I was an adult, 26, 27, that I really understood that probably in that period in between starting a business and, and finishing football, there was an element there where my mental health probably wasn't in the best place. Um, now, when you're 19 or even younger, you you probably don't realise that. Um, but if we do have the support mechanisms around, whether that's your coaches, your parents, your player care kind of people, that we can support those players regardless of the outcome. Yeah, and I think at the heart of so many businesses is this idea of addressing a need. And the truth is, if if your playing career doesn't end at 19 in the way that it did, that probably would have left you extremely disappointed. You don't take that passion into the business that you've built today and you don't make it a business that is so nurturing and caring in the way that it might have been by somebody who would have started that business who'd not had that experience that you had. So I, I get this a lot when I talk to business owners that at some level, the the, the success of the business is aligned with the character of the person that's growing that business. It's not just about the numbers. It's about the experience that that person brings. And clearly that's what you've done with your academy. Now, does that reflect in how you go about recruiting the other coaches and staff? Is that, are they kind of versions of you in that respect? Uh, yes and no, I think is, um, so I would say that in our industry in particular, I think you have to live and breathe it. You have to really live and breathe what we do working with young children. And, um, you know, it's not the most sociable job in the world. You work in the evenings, you work at weekends and, and that has its challenges. So, you know, we certainly look for people that are really passionate about it. And I think any business owner would always say that. I think over the last, again, I used the last five, six years, you know, I think it's become evidently clear to me that, that diversity in business is so important and, and having people who think differently and who aren't exactly the same way as maybe I am and, and you lean on their strengths. I think that's one of the things we do really well. You know, we have a team of, of staff and we'll all have different strengths and we'll all have areas of development, but we make sure we lean on those strengths one of our our real business value core values is celebrating success and you know i'm a big believer in i could sit here and talk about what you could get better at but why don't we champion what you do really well and really push that forward so we can do even more of that um and in the background yes we may work on those other elements um because i think traditionally as a business we look at you know, you look at your, your margins, your profit and all those elements and, and how people are performing. And I go back to our company sort of strap line ethos. It's using sport to change lives. Um, the first six years of business, I can safely say that I personally didn't earn loads of money um, because it was never my driving force. My driving force was to be able to create an impact um, in, my, in my local area and further beyond. And that's, again why I think we've been able to work with the number of children that we do work with because of because of that starting point. I think if I was to start a business today, it would look very different because I don't think I'd be able to do it in exactly the same way. You know, I've got two children, mortgage, all those other elements. So you would you would probably be more cautious around how you did some of the things. But I was a big believer in investing in staff, investing in people and making sure we could grow that way instead of it being sort of a, a I wouldn't say traditional, but a business owner that might sit there and, and re be rewarded for, for the outcomes as such. It's a remarkable story, Michael. You're probably not even conscious of it, but the truth is you're only 31 
and you've established a business that's been running longer than 10 years. And what people don't appreciate about business ownership is every year you're in business, you're learning more and more and you're getting better at making better decisions. And so if you started that process really as a youngster, as a 19 year old, and by the time you're in your thirties and forties, I mean, who knows where this could be, but you, you sound an incredibly, you sound like all good business people who've been running a business for a long time. You just, you just know your business, you know how it works, you know how it runs, you know its values. Um, but what is next, Michael? Have you got any plans to expand or franchise the business? Or is, is, are, you, or are you still in that stage of just learning about it and growing it? Uh, it's, a, it's a really good question. <clears throat> it's one that we, as a senior leadership, we talk about quite a lot. What are the next steps and where do we want to go? I think touching on the point there around franchising, I think for us personally, it's not a route we would go down. And one of the big reasons is we feel that it can, not always, but it can become really hard to quality control that. Um, and we feel that what we have as a team has been really strong. So yes, we want to impact as many people as possible, but we want to make sure it's done in the right way. Um, now, as a business over the last four years, we've, we've evolved and we actually now have three businesses. So we are actually three separate entities. Um, and within those, we have different areas that we want to grow and we want to push forward. Um, the, the largest one is we launched our own football club two years ago. A big driver for us at the moment, because obviously we're football-based business and we want to create a pathway and provide opportunity for children and the wider community. Um, obviously, I would anyone who's a football fan, I think if you support a team, whether it's a, you know Tottenham, Arsenal, Manchester United, Manchester City, those football clubs play such an important role in the community and can have such a wide impact to the community of that area. Um, but, but the goals are to create a pathway for boys and girls into senior football, but then how we can use the football club to support local community with other um, programmes, other interests. And I think such as the industry as well, we, we're looking at how we can use the club to create job opportunities um, for people in that area as well. So th there's a lot coming and the football club is something that we're really trying to push and drive forwards. And we've seen some, some positive steps over the last few years um, and still a long way to go. But when did you establish this football club and what is it? Is it really just a youth team? It's not senior, right? Yeah, so we, we, we piloted the team three years ago as a, as a standalone team um, to see how it would work and the things that would go right and wrong. We then launched it and rebranded it two years ago. So we're now into our third season as a football club. Um, currently, we have 10 youth teams. Um, we're growing. So what we, what we don't want to do is grow too big too early. Um, so we're organically growing. So hopefully in four years, four, three, four years time, we'll then have a men's, women and a, a sorry, a, a senior men's and women's team. Um, now, to get to that point, we've got a few hurdles to get over and there's things that we need to do, which which is part of my role, is to try and see if I can bring those to life, which is a challenge. Um, but that's that's the goal short term and then longer term, there's some other goals that we're trying to reach. And would a financial sort of revenue model involve effectively selling players or selling the the sort of players that are on those books of that football club is that part of the revenue sort of idea could be a way to grow a business I think you know longer term if you're talking about especially senior players and if we get to that point that's certainly yes a way to generate revenue and this is where again part of our business model for this club is is to be a self-sustaining football club um you know I'm I'm not a you know, I'm not a massive believer on, as I said before, like I need all the reward and the finance. And I think for me, one thing I would love to see is for my children and maybe their children and beyond is a longer lasting and this football club potentially being there for, you know, however long it could be there. Um, so our model is to try and be self-sustaining, as you say, generate how we generate funds at the moment. That's all funded through members and and that's how we, we run our football club. Um 
but one of the parts of our I, I probably shouldn't give too much away but one no of the you don't have to give anything away i think it's a listen it's an exciting idea um i guess at some point you're going to need a stadium aren't you <laughs> yeah and, and that's that's one of the things again that falls under my remit and how we do that and that's that's one of the things that will help us to become a self-sustaining football club um, because if you have your own facilities, obviously you, you can generate revenue, but you, you also stop the revenue going out to other people when you're hiring all these facilities that we, we do at the moment. Um, so that's that's a big stumbling block and certainly something that's a challenge. And other football clubs that have been in our shoes and still in our shoes are, are very similar. They're trying to find that because obviously in the UK, we know that land is a premium, so it's always hard to, to get land. And, you know... I can personally say that I'm not a builder and I wouldn't know the first place to start building a football stadium. Um, so whilst it, it seems quite a ludicrous thing to happen, you know, evidence would show me based on 10, 11 years of business that why not have these big dreams? Why not look forward? And, why and also I suspect it's one of those ideas that you could get investment for because, you know, it's, it's something that wealthy individuals who have, cash that needs to go somewhere would and, I, and my experience is it's, people aren't just investing in the idea they're investing in the people mm -hmm. rather than the idea uh, obviously the idea helps but it's really the people that that really attracts an investment and i think you'd, you're highly investable because of your track record of being in business i wouldn't call it a crazy dream at all i think it's really really exciting and i think it's really novel that you've started your own football club uh from the training and coaching side to create a football club from within that that then has aspirations for a senior version of that club and a stadium why not i mean this is a this is a an incredible business that generates billions and billions of pounds a year um i think it's really exciting michael and uh i'm excited and i i, I would invest in that <laughs> there you go we'll have to we'll have to have a separate conversation then when the time is right but yeah <clears throat> i think it's we're excited about it and the journey that we can go on with it because we we truly believe that it can change people's lives but i think that's where we we sit you know I think if you step away from the glitz and the glamour of the Premier League and the money that's there and <clears throat> you talk to some of the smaller football clubs further down the pyramid, the, the, the impact that they have on their communities. And that's what we want is to have an impact on community. And I think that's very admirable. And it comes across from the very first parts of this discussion is the idea that it's changing people's lives because I suspect it changed your life. And that's something that you want to give to other people. Uh, absolutely. You know, I uh, still to this day, and my wife probably wouldn't thank me for it, but the things that sport has given me, you know, are, are so true to the way I behave and what I do and, and, and probably the things that I will now try and instill in my children. So, uh, you know, sports had such benefits to me personally and I, and I think it can continue to have benefits for others. And that, that doesn't necessarily mean professional athletes. I think that's what we, we're trying to say. It's, it's not, that might be the pinnacle for some, but for others, it's not going to be. And there's so many opportunities and so many things that sport can provide. Um, we just want to be, um, I guess, if we can be a, a, a journey point for children and people to help them be successful, then that's, that's sort of our mission accomplished. Michael, what an absolute pleasure it has been to talk to you about your business and the exciting future it has. I suspect the 10 plus club you'll easily make 20, 30 and who knows beyond that. Congratulations, Michael, and good luck with the future. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you.